So maybe we can start. Hello, everybody. Today we have a pleasure to have a talk by Steve Su from the University of Michigan. Hello, everybody. Um, he will tell us about quantum hair and black hole information. Steve, one hour, please. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for joining the meeting. Uh, slight correction, I'm actually at Michigan State University, which is uh, close by, close to University of Michigan, but not exactly the same institution. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me go to my first slide. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Let me first give some references uh, relevant to the talk. So the talk is going to cover these two recent papers, which appeared in physical review letters and physics letters just in the last couple months. If anyone wants these slides, they're welcome to have them. They can email me or the organizers uh, for copies. In the PDF version of the slides, everything here is a clickable link. The link, uh, the, the sentence there that says colloquium uh, actually links to an earlier set of lectures that I gave, which are very a very pedagogical introduction to this topic. So people may be interested in that and it even goes through some history of, of black holes. I want to mention or recommend two different uh, review articles. The older one by Samir Matur formulates the black hole information paradox in what I think is the conceptually clearest way. And I'll actually make reference to his formulation of the paradox uh, in, in, my, in my presentation. The other review article I'd like to recommend is by Suvrat Raju, who I think spoke in this series not so long ago. I enjoyed his talk. Um, he and his collaborators have been working on an approach to this problem, which is very complementary to what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and I'll discuss that a little bit more on the next slide. The link here goes to the archive version of something I think which has just been published as a in physics reports and it's quite a lengthy lengthy and, and very uh, well written overview of the subject. Now I realize some people on this uh, uh, call are uh, experts in this topic and so in, in order to uh, help them because they may be very impatient with a pedagogical introduction to the topic, I just want to say very briefly what the relationship is between the new work that I'm reporting here and earlier work on ADS duality and something I might call information holography. So let me first define what I mean by ADS duality. That's the general idea that a bulk theory of gravity is dual, dynamically dual even, to a boundary theory which might be a gauge theory or conformal field theory. And then the usual uh, inference is that because it's assumed that the gauge theory dynamics on the boundary is unitary, that means that black hole evaporation itself must be unitary because I can map the black hole evaporation to some uh, ordinary gauge dynamics. What I refer to as information holography, and I'm taking this terminology from Raju, is the idea that it's related to one, but it's distinct from number one. It's the idea that the quantum state of the bulk configurations like a black hole can be determined from measurements or from correlation functions at the asymptotic boundary of space time. So it means that any information that's in the bulk is also recoverable in the boundary, but it's not a detailed mapping of, for example, the dynamics of what's happening in the bulk uh, to what's happening in the boundary. So uh, those are two concepts that have been uh, explored quite a bit in recent years. Um, and in addition, in, in the category of one, one could also add uh, specific calculations in which people try to calculate the page uh, entanglement entropy curve uh, using uh, ADS or duality. And the relation to the work I'm gonna present is the following. Both one and two suggest that black holes evaporate in a unitary way. Number two implies the existence of quantum hair. So if the information is recoverable asymptotically near the boundary, that means there must be something like the uh, quantity that we define here as quantum hair. Neither one or two really reveals how the black hole information manages to get from behind the horizon and be encoded in the outgoing Hawking radiation. And that's clear from other review articles that have appeared just recently in which people speculate on sort of gross non-locality or soft non-locality near the horizon. So, so there's still a kind of question of what is the actual dynamics by which information which is behind the horizon gets into the Hawking radiation. And, and I'll discuss that at length in this presentation. 
Okay. So let me begin from the beginning. Uh, Hawking first pointed out that there was an information paradox uh, quite a long time ago, 46 years ago, and theorists have since been uh, exploring this uh, question for some time. Now, uh, of course, starting from Newtonian gravity, you can see that uh, there's a possibility for irreversible gravitational collapse. Once you have a theory of general relativity, you can find exact classical solutions which describe black hole space times. And what Hawking did was study the propagation of quantum fields in the background of a black hole space time. And that's how he deduced the existence of Hawking radiation and Hawking evaporation. And uh, my claim here is that to solve the paradox, which Hawking uh, formulated uh, in, in, at a sort of level three description in this diagram, one has to go a little bit further. One wants to have at least some quantum description, not just of the quantum fields propagating in a classical background, but one wants to actually have a quantum description of the graviton fields themselves. And I don't mean a full UV completion of quantum gravity. I just mean some kind of sense of long wavelength properties of graviton fields, but at the quantum level. And that's what I'm gonna focus on. Okay, now the title of the talk involves the term quantum hair. Quantum hair is of course a play on a word play. So uh, John Wheeler coined the term black hole and John Wheeler also coined the phrase, I have no hair. And what he was expressing there is the result that classical black hole solutions can be classified. And there are a very limited set of kinds of long range hair or external fields that those black hole solutions can have. And they reflect uh, certain conserved quantities that are uh, properties of the black hole, like its mass or its angular momentum or its charge. And what we are going to investigate here is the extent to which quantum gravitational effects violate classical no hair theorems. And so the information that might be encoded in the quantum state describing the external graviton field of a black hole is something we call quantum hair. Okay, now um, in order to re uh, present the information paradox, let me just first make a remark about the causal structure of a black hole space time, because that, that's the most important ingredient that we need to formulate the paradox. And uh, as you know, the uh, light cone describing the possible future time-like propagation of a particle tips over when you pass the horizon of the black hole. So for a particle that's outside the horizon, its future can include, for example, future null infinity. However, once it passes the horizon, it's a property of the space-time that the light cone tips over and the particle will inevitably reach the singularity uh, of the black hole. And therefore it can no longer influence uh, points which are outside the horizon. So points inside the horizon are causally disconnected from points outside the horizon. Now, this is a cartoon, but it's a cartoon which uh, captures, I think, some of the important aspects of Hawking radiation. So in the vacuum, just outside the horizon, we have quantum fluctuations. Those quantum fluctuations should have the same quantum numbers as the vacuum. So they may involve, for example, an electron-positron pair. It could be the case that for a given fluctuation, one of the particles in the pair falls through the horizon and eventually then reaches the singularity, whereas its partner manages to escape, does not pass through the horizon and reaches uh, a future infinity. And that is in, in a cartoon language, the origin of Hawking radiation. Just to remind you, the temperature of a black hole is inversely proportional to its radius or its size in Planck units. So the temperature of a large classical black hole is extremely low and the lifetime of that hole is extremely long. It takes a long time for it to evaporate. And one final point, the, the length scale we're talking about here for these uh, uh, Hawking radiation, for the Hawking radiation is of order the Schwarzschild radius. So we're talking about long wavelength physics here. Okay, so here I have a Penrose diagram which describes the space-time 
of an evaporating hole, and in fact, a hole which can evaporate completely. And uh, we can follow the world line of an external observer. Uh, you could imagine it's someone in their rocket ship. And uh, that world line follows the points I've labeled A, B, and C. So at point A, the observer can look out the window of his rocket ship and he can see light that came from the star before it collapsed to a black hole. At point B, the observer in the rocket ship can see that there is a black hole and he can see Hawking radiation, which comes from the black hole. That Hawking radiation though originates uh, as uh, I indicated in the previous slide in fluctuations of the vacuum just outside the horizon. So causally disconnected from the material that has fallen through the star, through the horizon. At point C on the world line, the observer can look and see that the black hole has evaporated completely and is gone. And the statement that Hawking made back in 1986 was that black holes violate unitarity. In particular, they can cause pure states to evolve into mixed states. Okay, so as of about 1990, between say 1990 and the early 2000s, um, the paradox was typically formulated in the following way. We imagine that the space-time, which contains a black hole, is foliated by a set of space-like slices. Those are those blue uh, curves indicated in the Penrose diagram on the left. And we can look at the latest space-like slice, the, the, the furthest. And you'll notice that space-like slice intersects all of the matter in the star, which has already passed through the horizon. And if you look carefully, you can see that it actually can be made to intersect almost all of the Hawking radiation produced by the black hole as it evaporates. Now, on a given space-like slice, one can choose the coordinates so that all the events on that slice are simultaneous. And then one can apply a theorem from quantum information called the no-cloning theorem. And the no-cloning theorem says that the quantum state of the black hole, the, the, the blue material that's fallen into the black hole, cannot be replicated exactly in the Hawking radiation, which intersects the space-like slice at another point. And so that's a, a, a way that the uh, paradox was formulated as of around the 90s and early 2000s. As I said, I'm going to spend more time later in the talk discussing a, a more recent formulation by Samir Matur. But this gives you some idea of why there's a paradox. Uh, if, you, if you push the blue space-like curve further into the future, you can push it all the way to uh, near future infinity, you can see that it has lost some information. The, the information that was on the part of the space-like slice that is going to end up in the sing singularity is gone. And therefore I end up with a mixed state description of the universe at late times. Okay, now all of these formulations of the information paradox assume a fixed classical background geometry. And so that's sort of the, the third level of analysis in this sort of hierarchy of sophistication in descriptions of gravity that I described earlier. And in what I'm gonna describe next, we're gonna look at quantum fluctuations in the graviton field itself or the quantum state of the graviton itself. And we'll see that the inferences we make from just looking at the classical causal structure of the space-time are not entirely true. In other words, the, the claim that two regions are completely disconnected causally or that the information can't be present in both those regions simultaneously is not exactly true. And that will be due to this uh, quantity that we refer to as quantum here. In fact, a more precise statement uh, of what I just said is that the quantum state of the graviton field outside the horizon will be shown to depend explicitly on the internal state of the black hole. Okay. So let me summarize the main results of the first paper I referenced earlier. This is the physical review letters paper. So one result is that the asymptotic graviton state of an energy eigenstate source is determined at leading order by the energy eigenvalue. So imagine the following Gedanken experiment. I have a compact isolated source 
for gravitons. Suppose it's a rock or an asteroid. And now in general, a many body complex system will not be found in an energy eigenstate, but let's just assume for the sake of analysis that this, comp this macroscopic object isn't in an energy eigenstate. Then we can ask the following question, what do we know about the specific quantum state of the graviton field, which is sourced by this compact object? Unlike what we're used to in classical general relativity, we're not starting with a semi-classical T mu nu and then trying to relate it to another semi-classical object, uh, capital G mu nu. Here we are starting with an object which, although it's a complex object, it may be a, a rock with Avogadro's number of degrees of freedom, uh, that rock is meant to be treated fully quantum mechanically. And then we ask, what do we know about the graviton, the quantum state of the graviton field, which is sourced by that object? By that object. Now, um, what we show is that the asymptotic state of the graviton quantum state is determined at leading order by the energy eigenvalue. If we can ignore accidental energy degeneracies, then there's actually a one-to-one -one map between the state of the compact object and the state of the graviton field uh, asymptotically. And furthermore, if, if one then creates a superposition state of energy eigenstates to create a semi-classical matter source, then one gets an entangled uh, graviton state. I'm gonna elaborate on uh, these results further. The second main result of that. Is, a question here, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah so uh, if, if you look at an energy eigenstate by the uncertainty principle, isn't that just, I mean, just the matter source, isn't that necessarily delocalized if you insist on in it being an eigenstate? I mean, are you assuming that there exist compact eigenstates where the matter itself doesn't go out to infinity? Yes, so we are assuming that there's some kind of localized object, say some many body system, um, which is an energy eigenstate. And then we're asking the question, what can we say about the quantum state of the graviton field sourced by that object? Right, but when, you, when we look at energy eigenstate and quantum field theory, I mean, any energy eigenstate you write down will be one that differs even in the quantum field sector, forget about gravity, uh, from uh, you know, a localized state all the way out to infinity, just by the uncertainty principle. And that is, if it's a localized excitation, it can't have exactly, it can't have an exact energy. It must have yes. spread in energies to be localized. Yes, I think that's true. I mean, it, the, the, the statement that the object is completely compact, that there isn't some tail of its wave function that extends very far out uh, is just an idealization. It may not be exactly true. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so the second calculation which is performed in this paper uh, is in an effective action description of quantum gravity. And there it is a, a long range potential is shown to exist and the coefficients of those uh, of that potential actually depend on the internal state of the source. So in particular, we do calculations with dust balls and you can consider two different dust balls which have different profiles of density as a function of radius, but perhaps they have the same total mass. Now in classical gravity, you would not expect to find that there is a long range potential, which depends on exactly what profile I choose for uh, the uh, dust ball. But in fact, uh, in this quantum description, which includes one loop graviton effects, you see that actually the coefficient of R to the minus five does depend on the uh, profile. So this is an explicit example of how the graviton quantum state where the underlying quantum state is what corresponds to this potential, R to the minus five potential, encodes information about the internal state of the black hole. Okay, so let me elaborate more on the first result. So imagine that you have this compact source, which is an energy eigenstate, and suppose its energy eigenvalue is E. Now, one can actually write down the coherent state, at least the asymptotic description of the coherent state, which corresponds to the graviton state produced by uh, the source. And the easiest way to introduce this is to first think of the corresponding calculation in quantum electrodynamics. So in quantum electrodynamics, which also obeys a Gauss law constraint, which is similar to the Gauss law constraint in gravity, we can write down the vacuum state of the gauge field. So that's the left-hand side vacuum state 
uh, with the subscript Q, that means it's a vacuum state corresponding to a source with total charge capital Q. We can write that as a coherent state uh, of operators acting on the zero charge vacuum the B dagger operators are linear combinations of creation operators for the non-propagating, that would be the temporal and longitudinal components of the gauge field. This depends on specific choice of gauge. And the important thing is that the charge capital Q actually appears explicitly in the uh, exponential. Now it turns out, so this, this is a known expression, uh, but uh, maybe not so familiar to most people. Um, now, the interesting thing is that if you, follow exactly the same procedure for gravity, you get a, an analogous expression where B dagger now is a linear combination of graviton modes, but instead of the charge Q, you get the energy eigenvalue of the source state. And so this is an example which shows that uh, some very quantum mechanical property of the source, i.e. whether it's in energy state, energy eigenstate E or energy eigenstate E prime, is actually reflected in the quantum state of the graviton field that it produces. Uh, now, as I mentioned, go ahead. Yeah, Philip, ask you. Yes. Uh, yes. So, yes. Good morning. Um, can you just clarify exactly what you mean by the energy? It's an eigenstate of what? I mean, the Hamiltonian is very difficult to construct in a gravity theory. So what is it the eigenstate of in this particular case? Yes, so in, in approaching the problem the way we approached it, we were trying to think uh, very physically. So some approximations that we would like to make is that there is some kind of local description of this object, say this rock, and that we can describe it neglecting gravity uh, at first. And then uh, these, these te technical issues, for example, what you just described, we can think of as corrections to that initial description. So it could be the case that actually when you consider this very, very carefully and uh, you include, for example, quantum gravity corrections to the Hamiltonian describing this rock that uh, these results are modified, but we think they're not modified dramatically. Well, okay. I mean, Does that help? Well, it might be a correction, but you've also got an issue of covariance. I mean, yes, so, again, the Hamiltonian doesn't even transform as a well-defined object in, 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 a, in a general curve space. Yeah, so again, the, the goal here is to think physically about what is happening here. Obviously, if one wants to write an absolutely correct uh, technical description of what's happening, there are many, many complications uh, which intrude. So if you want to say this is not, it's not exactly clear what you mean by the energy eigenvalue of the source, I think that's a fair... Uh, critique, and then we can talk about, well, to what extent is it approximately the Hamiltonian of the system neglecting gravitational effects, uh, and then what are the corrections to that? Okay. But I mean, there is a well-defined notion of energy, which would just be the ADM energy, but I, I guess that's not what you're using. If you're an asymptotically flat space, you could always go to infinity and define the ADM energy, but my, probably that's not what you mean here exactly. Well, I think it will be pretty close to the ADM energy, the, the energy eigenvalue that would appear in this expression. I think, I think in fact, when you, uh, well, okay, let me, let me just continue. Another, this might help answer the question. So another way to derive this expression actually is something called the double copy relationship. So this is some, uh, this has been the, uh, the focus of some recent research in which the tree level uh, properties of quantum gravity are related to the properties of uh, a U1 gauge theory. And so the expression that I wrote uh, in the previous slide is the correct exact express expression for uh, QED. And then using this double copy relationship, one gets a result with essentially that result. Um, but then there will be the question of what did you mean by the E that replaces the Q? And if you look more carefully at the double copy relationship, you can see it looks like the ADM mass of the, of the source. But of course, there are corrections to this. But but you know the logical point is that is that something about the quantum state or quantum property of the source is present in the long range gravitational field. We're not purporting to calculate what that exact quantity is exactly. It may be a corrected version of some naive uh, Hamiltonian uh, energy eigenstate for the for the rock. I hope that I hope that helps. Okay, so 
let's imagine that uh, I want to describe a semi-classical matter configuration. So uh, generally, when we think of some rock we are going to encounter floating in space, we don't think that it's necessarily going to be in an energy eigenstate. In fact, it's going to be in some superposition of energy eigenstates or some semi-classical configuration. So we can write that as a superposition of energy eigenstates psi sub n with some given coefficients c sub n. And typically, we take the c sub n to have support in some narrow band of energies or some window of energies. But taking the earlier result, then if we want to write the quantum state of the gravitational field uh, in ter uh, for a semi-classical source, then we would get a superposition with the same coefficients c sub n, but of these, for example, coherent states that I wrote earlier, psi g, uh, each of which uh, depends on a particular energy eigenstate e sub n. Okay, now for people who are familiar with effective field theory, uh, these conclusions are perhaps not surprising. And in fact, I think for people who are used to doing quantum field, the uh, sorry, effective field theory, it's sort of what you would have guessed from the beginning. So let me give the following analogy. So we're used to the following, the situation that's depicted on the left. So imagine that you have a complicated state. That complicated state could be a baryon. It has three valence quarks. It also has some strongly coupled glue. It also has potentially fluctuations of quark antiquark pairs and electron positron pairs. It's a very complicated quantum state. But we can ask the following question. If I want to probe that object with a very long wavelength photon, what does that photon couple to? It turns out it couples to the total charge of the object. So the analogous statement here for gravity is now imagine I have my rock. I have some complicated uh, state, but it, it, uh, uh, some complicated many body system. And I want to ask how do long wavelength gravitons couple? to this uh, many body system, but I wanna do it actually at the quantum level. I don't wanna to resort to some coarse grained T mu nu and some coarse grained G mu nu. I want to actually ask what, what can I say at least at long wavelengths about the coupling between these two. And the statement that we've made in the previous slides is that to leading order, the coupling is given by the energy eigenvalue of this compact system. And if the compact system is in a semi-classical state, then you end up with uh, a, a graviton quantum state, which is a superposition of individual states like the coherent state that we presented. Okay, let me move to uh, result two from the first paper. Um, this has to do with a specific calculation and the calculation is done with a specific effective action. This is the one loop effective action in a curvature in an R, uh, R mu nu expansion. Um, and this effective action has been known for some time since I think the 1980s. However, the physical interpretation, how to do actual physical calculations uh, with this effective action, that's something that's been the subject of continued investigation. And there's there have even been advances just in the last, uh, I would say, 10 years or so in, in how to do these things. Um, I think in the 90s, uh, John Donahoe at uh, Amherst was uh, active in this, and my collaborator Xavier Calme and his group at Sussex have been active in this in more recent years. Now, what I've written here is a local and a non-local component to the effective action. Uh, the coefficients C1, 2, C1, C2, and C3, those are divergent, so those are sensitive to the UV completion of the theory. However, alpha, beta, and gamma, are uh, infrared quantities which do not depend on the UV properties of the theory. And in fact, the, the results that we're going to use are actually dependent on alpha, beta, and gamma, and not on C1, C2, and C3. However, one interesting sanity check on any calculations that you do using this effective action is that the renormalization group dependence on mu vanishes of any physical quantity that you compute uh, using this effective action. So from this effective action, we can derive modified Einstein equations. And then we can, in perturbation theory, calculate how a, the, the resulting classical metrics, which sol metric which solves the Einstein equations, depends on, for example, the properties of the source. And as I mentioned already, we in the paper, what we look at is dust balls. So that's one of the simplest possible things you can look at. We can fix the total mass of the dust ball 
but we can allow the internal structure of the dust ball, say its uh, density, energy density profile as a function of radius, to vary. And then what we show is that uh, there is an R to the minus five potential which arises purely from quantum effects. And the coefficient of this R to the minus five term actually depends on specifically on the density profile. So two different density profiles which have the same mass generate different uh, quantum corrected potentials. And so this is a, a concrete example of information uh, from a compact object leaking into uh, the quantum state uh, of its external gravitational field. Now, the details of what I just presented are not very important for the next part of the talk. So the, the only logical uh, component from the earlier presentation, uh, which carries over to what I'm going to say next, is just the idea that some information about the internal state of the black hole can be present in the quantum state of the external gravitational field. And now what I'm going to do is walk through the evaporation of a black hole. And in the next two slides, mainly what I'm going to focus on is just notation and bookkeeping. So there's nothing conceptually difficult about what I'm about to do. It's just a matter of just keeping track of all the notation. So assume for convenience that you have a black hole and this black hole evaporates in a very simple way. It emits one quantum at a time and there are a total of n quanta that are emitted in its evaporation. Now, of course, that's not exactly true. In one case, the black hole may evaporate into n plus two quanta or n minus five quanta, but just for the sake of making the notation simple, let's assume that there's just exactly n quanta that it evaporates into. Now, the symbol r sub i is meant to stand in for all the possible quantum numbers and information describing uh, the individual quanta. So Ri could stand in for the amount, the energy of the emitted quantum, its momentum, its spin, its charge, et cetera. But I'm just going to use R for compactness. And a final radiation state then, so after the black hole is fully evaporated, you may left, be left with just a radiation state. That radiation state is specified by this list, R1 through Rn. Now, we can define amplitudes for the emission of a particular quantum, Ri, for in, in the background of a particular quantum state of the graviton field. And that will depend on some information which is in that external state. And here we let the symbol E or energy stand in for that information. So earlier we said we can say some things about the exterior, the quantum state of the exterior metric. Um, one uh, uh, quantity that will influence it is the energy eigenstate or the energy eigenvalue of the source, uh, but there could be other things as well. For example, the charges and and uh, even some distributions of energy momentum of the uh, of, of the object. But for shorthand, we're just going to use E here. Now, at leading order, these amplitudes alpha are just the semi-classical Hawking amplitudes for a black hole uh, of mass E to emit a quantum Ri. And um, at leading order in the semi-classical approximation, of course, all the things which are which correspond to classical hair, one would expect could influence these amplitudes. But because we're trying to keep track of the full quantum nature of the external metric state, there, there are more things potentially uh, which could influence, which, uh, which alpha could depend on. OK. Now, um, even from the original calculation of Hawking, it was expected that there were subleading corrections. So even if you took uh, an arbitrarily large semi-classical black hole, there would still be some subleading corrections to his original expressions. These could be of the type uh, s to the minus k or e to the minus s, where s is the entropy of the black hole. And so it's not unexpected that there would be corrections to the uh, semi-classical functions alpha. Now, what is new here is the uh, claim that because of this quantum hair, the corrections can depend on the internal state of the black hole. And we'll, we'll track that through and see how that modifies the uh, final state of the radiation that we obtain. Um, it's been shown some time ago that uh, even if I start with the original Hawking description or Hawking state, uh, of the radiation, which is maximally mixed. So I, I start with a maximally mixed 
uh, density matrix describing the uh, radiation, but I allow myself to have exponentially small corrections. So in that density matrix, I allow myself to have e to the minus s corrections sprinkled throughout the matrix. Um, even corrections that are that small because of the dimensionality of the Hilbert space is so large can unitarize it. So even though I start with a density matrix, which is one over N on the diagonals, um, and then I include a sprinkling of E to the minus S corrections, one can show that uh, for the correct choice of those E to the minus S corrections, it could be possible that the, modif the, the corrected uh, density matrix satisfies a property trace rho squared equals one. So even very, very small corrections to these alphas are enough in principle to unitarize the evaporation. Okay, so now let me go step by step through the evaporation of the black hole. And again, we're, we're mainly just defining notation here. So I have some initial state psi i, which is describing the universe outside the black hole. And I write it as a superposition. These C sub n's are the same C sub n's that specify the original state of the black hole. So it was originally those C sub n's were if I were describing the source, were the C sub n's, which uh, were coefficients of the energy eigenfunctions uh, for the source object. Um, but they appear here in describing the external state, where the external state G of E n is the, the quantum state of the graviton field corresponding to a source in energy eigenstate E sub n. And so I sum over C sub n times that ket. And in the first line, then, I look at the emission of the very first Hawking quantum, which is R1. I sum over all the possibilities for R1, and I weight them by this amplitude. And the amplitude depends, obviously, on R1, but also depends on E sub n. And that's, that's the impact of the quantum hairs, that the E sub n can appear here in the alpha. And then as a final state after the uh, Hawking uh, quantum has been emitted, I indicate that that Hawking quantum is present by putting the R1 in the ket on the far right. And uh, this indicates G of E n minus delta one that the energy eigenstates have all been shifted down by delta one where delta one was the energy of the quantum that's emitted. So I have a different quantum state for the external graviton field and I now have a Hawking quantum present in the state. Okay, so we can continue this way where now I emit the second quantum. So now I'm going to emit quantum R2. I'm going to sum over all possible states R2. And now, in addition to the original uh, complex amplitude alpha, I have a second complex uh, amplitude alpha. But the argument of that second complex amplitude alpha is E downshifted by delta 1 because it had previously emitted quantum 1. And that alpha also can depend on the state of the quantum R2. So I get a product of these two alphas. And I can continue this way until I've emitted all the quanta that I need to, to make the black hole vanish. So the final state here has R1, R2, all the way to Rn. It has a product of alphas. Each of these alphas depends on the state that the previous quantum left the black hole in and the state of that uh, ith quantum. Okay, so I have a product of alphas. I have the original C sub n's, which describe the initial pure state of the black hole. And I have this uh, rather complicated expression for the final radiation state. Okay, so I've just recopied that final radiation state here. And in the final state, we emit reference to the geometry G because there's no more black hole by assumption. And effectively, uh, we're working in what is an approximately flat space time. And uh, we can see here, so what are some general remarks about this expression? So we end up with a complex superposition state, but that state depends linearly on the original C sub n's that specified the original pure state that described black hole. And so if I were to time reverse this process uh, for a given uh, set of CNs in this expression, this would evolve back in time, backwards in time unitarily into the original pure state of the black hole. So this looks like a manifestly unitary, although very complicated uh, evaporation of the black hole. Okay, so uh, I hope it was clear. I, I, I went through that in some detail just to establish the bookkeeping and the notation, just to 
make sure that we're uh, all on the same page. Now, I'm now going to make a point which is a little bit more conceptually challenging. Some people, sometimes people have trouble with this. So um, let's look at the distinct radiation patterns R1 through Rn. And let's note that they correspond potentially to different recoil trajectories of the black hole. So in the process of evaporation, the entire rest mass of the black hole is going to be converted into radiation. And in fact, there are exponentially a large set of possible trajectories, recoil trajectories that the black hole can actually follow. Um, it's been known for quite a long time that the uncertainty in the final center of mass coordinate of the hole actually goes like m squared. So it's quite a bit larger than the original Schwarzschild radius. So if you start out with a black hole sitting here, by the time it's evaporated, it may have recoiled in some very crazy trajectory so that it's very far, the center of mass of that final Planckian black hole that emits the final quantum that thing could be quite far away from the original uh, location of the original black hole. And so therefore, there are really many different background space times. And each of those, in fact, corresponds in a sense to a different Penrose diagram or a different set of coordinate transformations to get to that Penrose diagram, um, which correspond to the specific radiation patterns uh, that occur during the evaporation. And I want to stress that this point that there are macroscopically different radiation patterns and therefore macroscopically different black hole recoil trajectories and therefore macroscopically different geometries involved in this problem. That is already implied by the leading order Hawking calculations. We're not making any assumptions about the subleading corrections to alpha in order to come to this conclusion. We come to this conclusion just by looking at the leading order contributions to alpha. Okay. So here are some of my terrible hand-drawn pictures to illustrate uh, what I just said on the previous slide. So on the left, you have two different radiation patterns uh, describing the Hawking radiation coming from this black hole. Uh, on the far left, you can see there's a slight excess of photons heading off to the in the upper right direction, so the black hole recoils in the lower left direction. Uh, in, on to the right of that, uh, I guess I can use my pointer. Um, you can see there's a slight excess of photons going off to the upper left, so the black hole recoils to the lower right. And of course, in the set of all these R1 through Rns that we're summing over in our, our expression, all of these things are present, and they correspond to, if I were just to specifically look at the recoil trajectory of the black hole, they correspond to different trajectories of the black hole during this very long evaporation time. Okay, so we have distinct coarse grain radiation energy densities, therefore we have distinct black hole recoil trajectories, and therefore we have different space-time geometries involved. In, and all of those are present in the giant amplitude that I wrote down. Okay, so let me come back to Matur's formulation, which I think is conceptually the clearest formulation of this paradox. And let me see how our explicit expressions, these amplitudes that I've just written down, describing what looks like a unitary evaporation of the black hole, let's see how those manage to evade uh, Matur's formulation that there has to be, uh, in his case, an entanglement paradox or, or a, a pure state which evolves to uh, a mixed state. So let me just spend a few minutes reviewing his formulation of the paradox. So again, we have quantum fluctuations in the vacuum near the horizon, just outside the horizon. It is the case that the quantum, which in his notation is a B mode, the quantum that escapes to infinity and becomes what we call the Hawking radiation is highly correlated in state, is highly entangled with its partner in the, say, E plus E minus fluctuation. Uh, and the part it is a partner which falls into the black hole. So we cannot avoid, uh, barring some very radical exotic physics near the horizon, we cannot avoid that this entanglement is present when a given Hawking quantum is produced. So again, in his notation, the modes which escape to infinity are B1, B2 through Bn. Uh, the ones inside the horizon are E1, E2 through En. And uh, they uh, must occur in this, now this is a very schematic description, but it, it captures the essential point. They must occur in a highly entangled form so that the state of E1 is highly correlated to the state of B1. 
And so if I have a situation where uh, B1 reaches infinity and I have access to it, but I'm forced to uh, trace over the E modes, you say the E1 mode, because the E1 mode fell through the horizon and actually went into the singularity, then the entanglement entropy of the density matrix describing the B modes uh, will increase by, will be log, in this case, will just be log two. But for each additional quantum that's emitted, that will increase by about log two. Okay, and, and again, this is coming to this conclusion uh, is based on very simple principles that the, the vacuum state for an inertial observer falling through the horizon for a very large black hole must be very close to the standard Minkowski vacuum, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the assumptions are, are, are uh, very robust. Now, if I repeat this analysis n times, what it says is that each time I admit a Hawking quantum, there is some highly correlated mode, the, the e, e sub k mode, uh, which falls through the horizon and ends up behind the black hole. I ultimately lose track of all the E modes. I have left only a description of the B modes. That is necessarily a density matrix. Uh, and that density matrix uh, has a very high entanglement entropy. And this is, this is the entanglement paradox that uh, Mature formulates. So importantly, the claim is that if I only allow small corrections to Hawking evaporation, I cannot change the qualitative result that at the end of the day, I have a highly mixed state with entanglement entropy, which is roughly n times log two. It might be n times log two where there's some epsilon correction for each emitted quantum due to some effects that I haven't discussed. Uh, maybe the tidal forces modify the vacuum state just slightly at the horizon, et cetera. Uh, but as long as these epsilons are uh, small, Matur's conclusion is that one cannot avoid a highly mixed final state describing the B modes, and therefore an initial pure state describing the black hole must have evolved into a mixed state due to the Hawking evaporation. And I think this is the conceptually cleanest uh, formulation of the paradox, and it relies on very, very few uh, and, and very robust assumptions. Okay. so. Now, how is this analysis different uh, from what I described when I wrote uh, those amplitudes, which depend on this function's alpha? Well, as I belabored a little bit, uh, there are many different possible radiation patterns. So in Matur's language, there, one could consider two different patterns, B1 through Bn, and another B1 prime through Bn prime. And those could correspond to different semi-classical geometries. They could correspond to different nice slices. And for example, his E modes are defined, the E modes that you lose track of are defined as excitations with respect to the vacuum state in the region of the horizon. So that's determined by a particular center of mass position uh, of the black hole. And one might actually be talking about different, e, entirely different excitations, different E modes uh, uh, if, one assumes pattern B1 through Bn instead of B1 prime through B1, Bn prime. So, so it's, it's pretty clear if you think it through that his description is actually with reference to a particular background geometry and particular nice slices which are made on that geometry. Okay, now the B modes that he works with are just the R modes that we work with in the earlier slide. So those are the modes that make it to infinity and that are identified as Hawking radiation. And um, we don't have E modes in our description. What we do track is not the partner E mode which falls into the black hole, but we track the effect of that E mode on the internal state of the black hole. So we shift all the quantum numbers, including the energy of the black hole by an amount delta in his description that would be accomplished by this negative energy mode E falling through the horizon, entering the black hole. In our case, it's just accounted for by the fact that we conserve energy when we emit one of our R modes. And so we shift E goes to E minus delta, but then in the subsequent emission of the next quantum, the exterior metric state G of E minus delta is actually modified by that process. And that, that is due to the quantum pair. So, Again, like again, we, we use energy here, but uh, we have to track all the quantum numbers, not just the energy, the spin, the charge, and, uh, and everything else that's carried by the E mode. So if you 
look in our amplitudes, our expressions for the analog of his entangled state, that entanglement is described in this expression at the bottom of the slide, in which instead of writing out the E mode as a separate degree of freedom, we write the effect of the E mode having fallen into the black hole, having modified the state of the black hole, and then that modification of state being reflected in the graviton state, and the next quantum is emitted uh, in the background of that uh, graviton state. So, so to summarize it here, I've just recopied the, the evaporation expressions that I showed earlier. If you look inside this very complicated sum over all possible Hawking quanta, R1 through Rn, you will see that conditioned on uh, a particular pattern of a particular, say, energy momentum pattern of the R1 through Rn's, you will see copies of the individual mature states. So you will see highly entangled uh, expressions, uh, you know, highly entangled objects uh, in which the R mode is entangled with some aspect of the black hole. In his case, it's the E mode that fell in. In our case, it's the, it's the internal state of the black hole, which is then reflected in the quantum state of the exterior field. But you will see copies of everything that he does in our expressions, but you'll see multiple copies of each of his expressions, and then you will see entanglements between those expressions. So the factorized property that he assumes, it is true if you restrict to one given space-time geometry, but there are entanglements across those different space-time geometries which arise in this expression. Okay, so uh, if that was unclear, I'm happy to happy to go over it again at the end uh, because I think that's a that's the most uh, difficult part of the uh, results to understand. Uh, I'm going to try to explain this in a slightly different way. I'm going to use something called the property of concentration of measure. This may be familiar to people who follow quantum information theory. In the last 10 or 15 years, it's been realized that this geometric property of concentration of measure can be used to derive all the familiar results in quantum statistical mechanics. So imagine that we're looking at a very large Hilbert space, which I call Y. And in this case, we can think of Y as the Hilbert space of all the possible radiation states, R1 through Rn. The dimensionality of that Hilbert space is E to the uh, entropy of the black hole. So it's an extremely large Hilbert space. But now let's imagine that we're restricting our attention to a some small subset of the final state Hilbert space. So let's look only at the subset of the Hilbert space where there is a particular energy momentum pattern in the R1 through Rn or equivalently, equivalently one particular coarse grained recoil trajectory of the black hole. So there's this particular geometry that we're interested in that is a subset of all the possible different geometries that could have resulted from the full evaporation. Let's call that subset X. So concentration of measure uh, as expressed in something called Levy's lemma implies that if I take a pure state in the large Hilbert space Y, but I restrict my attention to the subset X so that I compute a density matrix tracing over the complement of X in Y, that that density matrix row of X will be extremely close to maximally mixed. In other words, it'll be very close to thermal, like the radiation that you find in Hawking's original calculation. Now, this is a slightly abstract way to present uh, what we've been discussing, but effectively what it says is that if you restrict attention to one particular geometry and you study Hawking radiation on that subgeometry, you will find that uh, the evaporation looks maximally mixed even though the full description of it in the full Hilbert space is a pure final state. And that's a, that's a consequence of uh, Levy's lemma. Okay, now what is lost when I trace over everything, in, in, I trace over the complement of X in Y, what is lost is the entanglements between different X and X prime. So equivalently between different uh, patterns of uh, macroscopically different patterns of Hawking radiation or macroscopically different black hole recoil trajectories. So we, if, we, if we ignore those, then of course we come to Matur's conclusion that a pure state has evolved into a maximally mixed state. 
However, if you keep track of those entanglements, which are in this final state expression that I gave earlier, then you'll see that nothing like this has happened. In the, in the larger Hilbert space Y, a pure state has evolved into a pure state, and one only concludes that there's a mixed state because one willing, one intentionally forgets or, or unintentionally forgets about the correlations between different X and X prime. Okay, so let me let me stop here, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, let me just uh, give uh, a little bit of a summary here. So, the first point I want to make is that classical no-hair theorems do not extend to the quantum realm. So, if you ask, in, in fact, it's almost the opposite situation where instead of a limited amount of information being encoded in classical long-range fields outside the black hole, you have kind of the opposite. It looks like effectively all the information uh, describing the quantum state of the black hole source is encoded in the quantum state of the graviton field, the external graviton field. And we've only used results or argue, physical arguments here from long wavelength quantum gravity. So we're not making any assumptions about short distance physics, string theory, et cetera. These are just uh, inferences that we make by thinking about how quantum gravity has to behave at long wavelengths. Now, once you accept that there is something like quantum hair, one can ask how does it affect the Hawking radiation or evaporation process? And one can actually write down amplitudes, which at leading order are the Hawking amplitudes, have some potentially exponentially small corrections, which are sensitive to these quantum hair effects. And the overall result is unitary. And we have not invoked any exotic new physics. We've only invoked physics that people already thought was going to be present. So these, these subleading corrections were thought to already be uh, present. And uh, the final point is that if you look at any of the standard formulations of the information paradox, you find that in, in building those uh, formulations, people have restricted themselves to some particular sub small subset of the evaporation Hilbert space, typically by assuming one fixed background geometry and then working on that back background geometry. I mean, that, that goes all the way back to Hawking's original calculation. But the moment you actually ask questions about entanglement between different space-time geometries or uh, treat the entire Hilbert space, it becomes much more plausible that, uh, the, that the evolution of the black hole is, uh, does result in a final pure state. Okay, let me stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Steve, for your very interesting talk. Questions, please. Okay. Ah, Gabriel Veneziano, please ask your question. Okay. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, I'm sorry, I could not take it from the very beginning. I, I had to do something. Uh, so I would like to understand better your first statement in the conclusion. Uh, that comes from the non-local action. The fact that there's... <clears throat> This, the, the gravitational field outside depends on the, on the microstate. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, they're, they're, they're... Can, you, can you give me the key, the key argument yeah. for that? I, I'm happy to do that. So I, I went back in the slides. Can you see the top of the slide says asymptotic quantum yes, state? Sure, sure, I can. Okay, yes. so, so there are two ways of presenting this. One is to ask if I have a source a compact source with energy eigenvalue E, can I say something about the long range coherent, the, the asymptotic coherent state of the graviton field mm -hmm. resulting from that source? Yeah. And one can do this in, al in analogy with QED, but it's actually more precise than analogy actually. Um, and you can see that in the case of QED, the, uh, the gauge field state depends explicitly on the charge of the source. In gravity, that Q will be replaced by the energy eigenvalue. Sure. No, that's of the the I got. Yes. I, I okay. So, that slide. So, so that is an example of quantum hair. A more explicit example of quantum hair is to take this uh, standard one loop effective action for quantum gravity and look at uh, a source which is a dust ball fix the total energy of the dust ball, the total mass of the dust ball, but let the profile, the density as a function of radius vary. And then ask what corrections using this effective action do you get to the uh, potential, the external gravitational potential of the dust ball? 
-hmm. We find corrections, which are one over R to the five, but the coefficient of the correction depends on the profile, the internal composition of the dust ball. Mm -hmm. So it's an example of a quantum gravity effect, which is uh, long range, but it depends on the internal state of the source. So it's, it's because, another example uh, of- This is because of these non-local corrections. Correct, correct. Because otherwise you have a, you have the no hair theorem for the classical theory. So you, it, it is an effect from this uh, non-local terms, which by the way, this is not the full list, right? I think this is the full list of R cube one over box pieces. Yes, this is fourth. This is at order R squared. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. But uh, it's exactly what you said. So once you allow the graviton to be treated at least somewhat quantum mechanically, so mm -hmm. technically the classical no hair theorems do not apply, you, okay. you immediately find a violation of the classical no hair theorem. Okay. Okay. So what you say if if you start from a pure initial state to form the black hole, then you will form a particular interior state and you will be able to see it in quantum yes. gravity. Yeah. Yes, so here on the upper left, the CNs describe the specific interior state of the black hole, but then if you have quantum hair, that could be reflected in the quantum state of the external graviton field. Then if you just track it through very elementary quantum mechanics expressions, you actually can end up with something that looks completely unitary. But uh, the cost of it is you get a very complicated superposition state, which extends over many different radiation patterns. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I understand. Okay, I have to look at the, at, the, at the calculation. I guess it's in your paper. This R yes. is minus five. Yeah. Could yeah, I just add to that, uh, uh, that that last comment? I think uh, just uh, just to give one more perspective on the you know I think it's clear that I, I don't think it requires any non-locality. It it comes uh, I mean almost immediately as Steve was saying once you include quantum mechanics. Let me give one simple example to show why I mean it, why you know one doesn't need non-locality to see the violation of the no head theorem. So just imagine two balls of dust. One of which is is uh, you know. Uh, compact and the other which is not compact. I mean, just if you think of how you would build them in, in quantum field theory, uh, the ball which is compact, you would build up by taking a larger spread of energies and the ball which is dilute, you would take by, you know, you'd build up by using a smaller spread of energies. But if you treat the graviton quantum mechanically, you look at fluctuations of it, just fluctuations of the ADM Hamiltonian, they will contain information about the spread. So it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that uh, from the get-go, I think that in quantum mechanics, one cannot just characterize the, the state by uh, you know, total energy. So that maybe, I mean, here the argument was different, but maybe that also helps to answer the previous question. I mean, you, you, you may not need non-locality, but you have to go away from GR, I guess, from classical GR. No, I think we just impose the wheeler devitt equation. So, I mean, it, you, you don't impose G mu nu with the expectation of G mu nu, rather you impose that G mu nu minus G mu nu and highlights the wave function, and that is enough. So, I mean, it's imposing the wheeler devitt equation, I think, is enough to get this. Mm -hmm. Yes, but uh, that, that's beyond classical general relativity, uh, certainly. Yes, yes, of course. Um, I, I think, you know, again, I want to emphasize the complementary approaches. So, the, the information holography results that Raju's group obtains are, are very, very nice. And we just took a much more pedestrian point of view. We just asked, well, what do I actually know about the relationship between the, the quantum state of a, a rock and the quantum state of the graviton field that it produces? And I, I just realized I had never seen that really worked out in any detail uh, because we always typically assume that we have a semi-classical T mu nu and we have a semi-classical G mu nu. So I wanted to just dig a little bit deeper into that. But I think once you dig, you see there must be something like quantum hair. Okay. Concerning, so, yeah. Okay, please. Concerning your R minus five uh, calculation, what exactly was the source? Did it form the black hole? Did it uh, go to singularity or dust ball? No. So in in the paper, the PRL, we only look at dust balls. So we don't look at them 
uh, collapsing all the way to form black holes. We have some additional work, which we haven't published yet, but we're preparing, where we follow the collapse of the dust ball further uh, in a time-dependent way. But the statement it, that's made in the PRL is just that if you have a dust ball, uh, you still violate uh, the kind of no hair idea that it's just the mass of the dust ball that determines the field. You get these quantum corrections, which uh, give you a, a, a composition dependent coefficient. Well, that's not, doesn't quite concern uh, the black hole physics, right? That's correct. What, that's what correct. What we want the, to see is that you have something uh, behind the horizon in the black hole interior and it influences whatever geometry or anything outside the horizon. That's what you want, right? That's correct. So we don't, we don't follow it far enough to see, for example, the singularity in the, in the dust ball. But uh, we, we, you may see it in a subsequent uh, paper that we're preparing. OK. OK. There are more questions. OK. Uh, Igor Varovich, please ask your question. Yes. Can you show, please, an example of a metric which describes uh, quantum haze. Is it uh, okay? So Majulo, the yes, I mean Majulo, the comment that was just made that these are to the minus five corrections. Uh, we don't, we haven't proved that they persist after the dust ball becomes a black hole. Maybe they, maybe they go away or something. Um, but an example of a metric is the metric which in the paper solves these corrected Einstein equations. So these corrected Einstein equations have this extra one over R to the fifth, in addition to the Schwarzschild uh, terms, has a one over R to the fifth correction. And so you could think of that as a kind of uh, explicit uh, quantum hair in the metric. So it relates the energy condition. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Positivity of energy. Uh, I'm sorry? Igor would like to ask, do you assume some extra condition on the matter, something like positive energy condition or something like that? Or was this, uh, is this relevant oh, for your consideration I, or not? I, I, think, I think what he might, what you might, let me rephrase your question. I think you're saying that Classically, to violate the no hair theorem, you need to violate an energy condition. Uh, however, here, because we're dealing with quantum modified equations, these are equations of the Einstein equations, which result from a quantum modified effective action. I'm not sure that's that requirement is there that to violate the no hair condition, one has to violate the energy condition. I'm not sure that connection is there. Is it correct to say that you suggest to discuss some idea? but you postpone computations for a future. No, I would say, I, I mean, the, the, the corrections with this specific uh, effective action that are shown here are actually performed and they, they produce this R to the minus fifth correction. Okay, thanks. Okay, ah, I see that Gabriel Veneziano would like to ask one more question, correct? Gabriel, do you want to ask more questions? Or you forget to lower your hand. I forgot to lower my hand. Okay, okay, <laughs> very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see the questions from Sravan Kumar. Sravan, please ask your question. Uh, hi, Steve. Uh, thanks for the very nice talks. So my question is uh, related to this effective action. Uh, suppose, you, I mean, uh, these coefficients C1, C2, they depend on the matter theory you consider right yeah. because you, 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 you right the, 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 the one loop the, the one loop sorry uh, sorry uh, can, you I, can you hear me can you hear me i can hear you okay sorry okay. I, I i hear my own voice uh, anyway uh, okay um, my question is that this c1 c2 this question depend uh, depend on the matter theory right i mean whatever the matter you consider uh, right yes. uh, but uh, uh, all these coefficients can be exactly determined as far as I know that coefficient of R square is already, uh, always free and uh, you can always free to choose any kind of uh, C value for C1. It is not fixed. Well, uh, it, it, I mean, 
in a sense, you're right, because this theory is not renormalizable. So it's, it's, it's not clear physically what you mean by this theory, right, until you put some additional conditions on it or, or you, you, you give me the UV completion of the theory. So, um, however, I should point out that the, the main result, which is the R to minus fifth uh, potential correction, those, that arises from alpha, beta, gamma, not from the C1, C2, C3. Okay. Then what about C1, C3? I mean, do you assume them to be small? Uh, are they irrelevant in your consideration? Um, they don't affect the result because uh, the result is a long distance effect. Um, now, you could just say, like, uh, we can agree maybe we have some low energy effective theory of gravity where C1, C2, and C3 have their sort of natural size. Uh, from effective field theory thinking, and and then that that would not affect our result, for example. Okay, and if you assume uh, them to be small, yes. Uh, well, I'm wondering because in the in stellar gravity there are some new solutions which are uh, the new spherically symmetric solutions which are away from the Schwarzschild and totally different solutions exist in stellar gravity. So I see. Yeah, we, so we only confusion. We, we only perturb. For, we, we start with uh, the standard Einstein equations. We take the standard solution and we just perturb it. So we, we maybe you know in, in a partic for a particular choice of these coefficients, maybe we're missing some completely different classical solution or something. But uh, that that's not uh, something we set out to look for. Okay. Thank you. Okay. More questions, please. I don't see more questions. Okay, maybe I will ask myself a question. Still, still could you please make some comments um, about possible relation, if it exists, between your proposal or mature proposal and iron proposal? Uh, you, you know, <laughs> yes. Well, okay, the, I think, I think, so first of all, I, I, I'm not an expert at all on these recent island calculations. I actually think uh, Raju, who's on, the, on this meeting, he, he has some very definite opinions about the relevance of those calculations to the, 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 the information paradox. Um, I would just say from my perspective, I'm not sure because I, I haven't carefully studied what those people have done. Mm -hmm. I see. Maybe somebody would like to make some comments about this. So could, I, could I make a comment? Actually, I, I also wanted yes. to make a comment on uh, uh, on Rubikov's question earlier about the collapsing ball of dust. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, when you look at why information is outside, it comes from looking at the structure of constraints uh, on a Cauchy slice. So in, in this, the horizon doesn't really matter, you know, because you're, you're looking at a Cauchy slice and the horizon is a teleological concept. So, of course, it's important when you look at the, you know, the, the boundary of, of null infinity. But uh, here, here, what one is trying to say is that when one solves the constraints on a Cauchy slice, uh, the data at infinity or data out here you know, is affected by the structure of the dust. So it, it, it doesn't really matter whether there is or there isn't a horizon later. I mean, for, for this kind of an argument, that's one comment that I had to make. Uh, the, uh, the second comment was about islands. I mean, so that there, there, I guess we also discussed it many times, but uh, uh, I think the islands are very nice, but they involve, I think, slightly non-standard models of gravity in that they consider models of EDS gravity coupled to a non-gravitational bar. So these are models which where you know, gravity is non-standard because it switches off at some point. There's a non-gravitational bar. And the second feature of these models is that in the, uh, in the place where gravity is dynamical, the graviton has a mass, and therefore the Gauss law doesn't hold. And the Gauss law is very important in all of these ideas, but in the island proposal, one doesn't have the Gauss law because it goes away as a result of the back reaction of the non-gravitational bar. So those are different models, I think. I mean, they're nice calculations, but I think they are slightly different models. Okay, thank you for your comments. More questions, please? Okay, uh, maybe I will ask 
uh, one more question. You can consider a pure, a pure gravity. What happens if you consider interaction, some arbitrary interactions with our field? If you consider a special, for example, extremal black hole, if there are some special feature uh, related with some particular dynamics of this kind of field, what do you think? Uh, I don't have anything uh, very insightful to say about that. Uh, we've actually taken the kind of opposite view of trying to just reason in the most primitive, robust way, <laughs> not okay. not thinking about special cases like an extremal black hole. Um, so I, I would need to think a little bit about that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. More questions, thank please? Thank you. If no more questions, let us thank the speaker again. It was very interesting and very clear presentation. Thank you very much. And don't forget to send your transparencies to Alexei Koshilev. You will put on the website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. But they were already Thanks. Sent. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we already have the slides uh, from Steve, so we can upload. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, have you. a good day. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Thank you.